in the maze of alleyways that formed up Whitechapel and London's East End, five women were killed and dismembered between August and November 1988. Some had their throats slit, faces slashed, and organs removed. Who was responsible for these heinous killings? As the killer moved around to London's underbelly, the press had a field day. The killer, dubbed Jack the Ripper, has never been identified. But there certainly are some theories as to who he or she was. Today, we are exploring the infamous Jack the Ripper murders. Our story begins when Mary Ann Polly Nichols' body was found on August 31st, 1988 on Bucks Row Whitechapel at around 3.40 a.m. The discovery was made by two carmen, Charles Cross and Robert Paul, who were on their way to work. Polly was found laying on the ground with her skirt hitched up to her waist. Initially, Cross and Paul thought she was just another drunk street worker. But minutes later, the police chief, John Neal, arrived on the scene as part of the evening patrol and went over to see what was going on. Neal's lamp lit up Polly's face and her eyes, glazed and unseeing, told him she was dead. Her lower abdomen had been partially torn apart by a sharp, jagged wound, and her throat had been brutally slashed in two places, virtually decapitating her. The same knife was used by the murder to make more cuts to her abdomen. Her time of death, according to the doctor who arrived at the scene to examine her body, was less than 30 minutes before she was discovered. But Polly wasn't the last of it. Just eight days after Polly was found mutilated on the streets, a woman named Annie Chapman was found in the backyard of number 29 Hanbury Street in Spitalfields. Her abdomen had been completely torn open, and her throat had been sliced in a manner similar to how Polly was found just days before. Her torn out, still attached intestines were positioned over her right shoulder. Her uterus and some of her vagina were removed, according to the autopsy performed afterwards. A witness later came forward claiming to have seen her talking with a man outside 29 Hanbury Street at around 5.30 a.m. Albert Kadosh, who lived at 27 Hanbury Street, claimed to have heard a woman in the backyard of number 29 say, no, followed by the sound of what appeared to be the body hitting the fence. It would be just 20 minutes after this that she was found. Police immediately tied both Annie and Polly's murders together, and the press began reporting closely on the Whitechapel murders, and the killer they named Jack the Ripper. On September 27, 1988, the Central News Agency received the following letter, written in red ink. Dear Boss, I keep on hearing, the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. I am down on whores and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me and my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope, haha. <laughs> The next job I do, I shall clip the ladies' ears off and send them to the police officers just for a jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get the chance. Good luck, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade name. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands. Curse it, no luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now, haha. <laughs> The letter was passed on to the police the next day who initially thought it was a fake. But just two days later on September 30th, 1988, two women were found dead in alarmingly similar circumstances. The first, Elizabeth Stride, was found at around 1 o'clock a.m. in Dutfield's yard, Burner Street. Her left artery was severed when the perpetrator slashed her throat, but no further cuts or slashes were visible. Elizabeth's injuries didn't exactly match those of Polly and Annie's, but expert analysts were able to confidently say that the way in which her throat was slit matched the earlier murders. 
but why would Jack leave without performing his usual mutilations? Well, it's widely believed that after murdering Elizabeth, he was disturbed by someone, or someone walking the street late at night. Not wanting to be caught, he fled, unable to finish what he started with Elizabeth. Jack went back on the prowl, seeking out another victim. And so 45 minutes after Elizabeth was found, bloody murder was screamed once again in the back streets of Whitechapel. Catherine Eddowes was found in Mitre Square. Back to the usual MO, her abdomen had been ripped open and her throat had been severed. Her uterus and the majority of her left kidney had both been removed. An eyewitness came forward and said they had seen Catherine with a man minutes before she was found. The witness described the mysterious man as being around 5'7 in height, 30 years old, with a medium build, fair complexion, and a mustache. Weirdly, the witness described the man as wearing what looked like a sailor's outfit. After the double murders, the police released the initial letter to the press in the desperate hope for more leads. But all they were met with was yet another letter scrawled in the same red ink. The postcard's author did not include a date, although it did have the postmark London E, which was dated October 1st. It reads, I was not cotting, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jackie's work tomorrow, double event this time. Number one squealed a bit, couldn't finish straight off, had not the time to get ears for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. More and more letters poured in. I write you a letter in black ink, as I have no more of the right stuff. I think you're all asleep in Scotland Yard with your bloodhounds, as I will show you tomorrow night, Saturday, I'm going to do a double event, but not in Whitechapel. Got rather too warm there. Had to shift. No more till you hear from me again. Jack the Ripper. And then, a small package wrapped in brown paper and with an illegible London postmark was soon after delivered to the head of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, George Lusk, on Tuesday, October 16, 1988. The package contained a piece of a kidney, and a message in the same handwriting as the postcard from a few days earlier were included in the package, which said it came from hell. I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. The other piece I fried and ate it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out, only if you wait a while longer. And then came Jack's final, most brutal murder. Mary Jane Kelly was discovered laying on her bed in her one-room apartment at 13 Miller's Court off Dorset Street, Spitalfields on the morning of Friday, November 9th, 1888. She had been horrifically disfigured and dismembered. Kelly's body had been horribly disfigured. Her breasts had been removed, her entire abdominal cavity had been emptied, and her viscera had been purposefully placed on the nightstand and beneath her head. In addition to having her heart removed, Kelly's face had been cut off at the crime scene. But who was behind these killings? After over a hundred years of countless conspiracies and suspects, Jack's identity has still not been revealed. But let's dive into the rabbit hole and look at some of the biggest theories in this case. One of the most infamous suspects is none other than Prince Albert Victor, grandson of England's Queen Victoria. There are two quite different theories behind this. In the first, while visiting the West Indies, Albert allegedly caught syphilis from a prostitute. The illness got worse over time and eventually started attacking his brain, causing him to go insane. Once the illness had taken hold, Albert sought revenge and began attacking prostitutes he encountered in the dead of night on London streets. And so, the Ripper killings began. The next theory is that Albert had a secret relationship with a woman named Annie Crook, a local shop worker. When Albert's family found out, they moved quickly to cover up the scandalous affair and ordered royal physician Dr. William Gull to have Annie sent to the asylum. But Annie had confided in some friends about the affair. Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, and Mary Jane Kelly. The group knew Annie wasn't mad and threatened to go to the media about the cover-up. At this point, things were getting out of hand, so the royal family ordered them to be killed too. But if that were true, how did Catherine Eddowes get caught up in the mix? Let's move on to another story. 
Another suspect that had been thrown around, especially in recent years, is artist Walter Sickert. Born in Munich on May 31, 1860, Sickert came to England when he was just eight years old. As a child, he was extremely sickly and after numerous operations were allegedly left impotent. As he grew up, he lashed out at women, and as his depravity grew, so did his anger towards the women he could never be with. Crime writer Patricia Cornwell popularized this theory with her book, Portrait of a Killer. Patricia portrays Sickert as possessing the sick, anti-feminist psychology of a serial killer and identified clues Sickert left in his paintings. Cornwell went on to fund her own DNA test to support her theory. She had the DNA on stamps from the Ripper letters examined and actually got a match. But what if Jack the Ripper wasn't a man at all? From the beginning of the investigation, when Mary Kelly was killed, Inspector Aberline himself began to wonder if Jack the Ripper might have been a woman. A book titled Jack the Ripper, A New Theory, published in 1939, helped to popularize this concept. It said that even if she was covered in blood, a woman, perhaps a crazy midwife, could prowl around in the early morning hours without raising too many red flags. Additionally, the midwife would have been familiar with the anatomy and might have performed the mutilations. A probable Jill was even identified. Mary Perse, who was found guilty and put to death in 1990 for brutally killing a mother and her child. And finally, our last theory today is that the author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll, was responsible for the serial killings. Lewis had always been the subject of rumors due to the pedophilic nature of his relationship with the real-life Alice. But in the 1990s, this theory was brought to the spotlight when Richard Wallace released his book, Jack the Ripper, Lighthearted Friend, where he laid out clear evidence that Lewis was involved. Wallace rearranged letters in some of Lewis's work to create sentences like, I got a tight hold of her and cut her throat. Whoever he or she was, the mystery of Jack the Ripper remains. His brutal reign of terror ended one way or another, and his identity is one still shrouded in conspiracy. Who do you think it was?